Hoseo. Hoseo. Kyrie, theon matar. Hail, mother of gods, thou wife of starry heaven. That's a Homeric hymn to the earth. And that's a clue to my, my theme today. Uh, first off, we'll go look right here. This is my principal illustration here. Uh, this is Hera, and she's the goddess of gods, like that, most ancient. And uh, this piece that I made here, I have replicated by way of this uh, bird feed bag to give volume. Um, it's the head of this goddess that was found archaeologically in Olympia the west side of uh, the Peloponnese. So I put it on this bird seed bag uh, to give the volume, like, like the head of her, and it goes with Bird Watcher Supreme, because her priestesses were called the birds. And so with that, you can kind of go over here and look at this statue. So this statue here is a way that I'm honoring, I'm really giving honor to the ancient priestesses of the various and many uh, temples of the goddess. The Irie uh, were, were the priestesses, or in Hera's temple, can even be called the Herophilae. So that's the way that I'm honoring this. Uh, these temples, they were there for, who knows, thousands of years. So. Probably there are thousands upon thousands, maybe even millions, of women who served in these temples up until Christianity had overtaken everything and closed it down. So over the period, so you can come back to me. Um, Greece, we have a we have, in this country we have a democracy, and we have certain values, even if they're ideals of being free people, like that. So all of this has stemmed from the ancient country of Greece, or what we call Greece. And so that's something that I definitely want to connect with. And I've also been stemming this succession of coyote talks from beginning in March with the woman's hearse green on through the earth and on through the water to connect all of this. And a realignment we can call it that, with the ancient female principle, the ancient female principle in this respect, Hera, which also is the Greek word for earth, and earthia meaning the earth goddess. And to make that kind of alignment, because she, as a goddess, we'll use that word, represents everything of woman, everything of the feminine and the colleges of the women who were the priestesses, everything that a woman would need to know. They had, you know, the specialists in that and all of that. And to also help, I keep constantly trying to help, to realize that here in Native America, Turtle Island Native America, our relation and our connection to the ancient Mediterranean, which has been ignored and overlooked even when in the earlier times that some people from Europe did seem to recognize it, but that was uh, put aside. So let me mention just a little bit of that. I'm going to start with the Yaquis, the Yaquis that live in Sonora and Arizona. Their name for themselves is the Ohemi. The Ohemi, the Hemi, is an Egyptian word for the people. That and many other things. In fact, the totality, most of their language definitely shows that they are, are, they are Egyptian. They are Egyptian Copts. Copts means uh, Christian Egyptians. And so they are not, you know, some kind of primitive people. So definitely they have stemmed from the Mediterranean. Another people here are people that the Americans call the Zuni. The Zuni, their name is the Ashui. They are Berbers from Libya, from North Africa. And their name, Ashiwi, is the Egyptian word for them, and that they still know themselves that way. Other incidents, their um, Pueblo 
that was attacked by the Spaniards, Coronado, uh, was called um, Hawiku. Hawiku meant the house of the goddess. And the goddess that they were the people of was the civil, and their warriors were called the Cabel. And Coronado, who had been to Morocco, recognized that. Further, that the, these people, the Ashui, also in the woods or the mountains nearby the Pueblo, have a shrine for the lion. It's a lion shrine, we put simpler. Now that is a duplicate of such a shrine in the Mediterranean on an island, coast, just south of Athens. And there is a great stone lion there. And the alignment of that stone lion shows that he definitely stood for the summer and winter solstices, to put it simply. But that is one thing for me that would be very conclusive that these people have stemmed from there. Another people, at least nominally, at Pyramid Lake, the Americans call the Paiutes. Their name for themselves is the Numa, and the anthropologists' name for their language is Numic. And the things that are found there in that vicinity, including Libyan or Numic letters, Numidia is part of Libya. So these people by that name have also come from the North Africa, Berbers, and so forth. So uh, that's you know some of the things that come to mind. The Cherokee, the Cherokee certainly are of the Phoenicians, another Mediterranean people, and particularly have uh, made a culture that is very similar to the Biblical Hebrew. Uh, and some of the early English Americans did recognize that. And so just you know putting that simply that we do have a relation to the Mediterranean and we do know about it in spite of the fable of American history that's been put on everybody here. So that's a way to say why we need to know that along with the Black Lives Matter where now those things are really being you know, questioned and thought about and uh, some wanting things to change. Uh, we need to change a lot of other things. The idea of having anti-Semitism here is absurd. It's so if you knew the correct history that we've inherited, you would know that that would be really an absurd thing to carry on, that kind of thing. So all of that is a way that I'm starting with this. The whole system of the Greek islands was seen as the equivalent of the starry skies. The problem of latitudes was resolved in remote antiquity, probably by the means of bearings made on the stars. And as such, the uh, three major temples of Hera were all on this perfect latitude, uh, exactly the same latitude, and it's reckoned that these coordinates were made between 1200 BC and 800 BC. There are several systems of that. So early as we do see that you know they were looking at the stars and they were making you know uh, uh, judgments and alignments, and then it's called kind of a succession of evolvements. You know the planets, the seven planets, like that, and then finally, particularly finally, uh, the zodiac astrology. So one thing after another. So these systems sort of blend and different parts of Greek. Uh, Greek you know, has a land mass and many, many islands. And there are various centers you know, to that. And so temples, and we'll call them that, temples were built exactly in these alignments. So that we definitely have the latitudes like that. And eventually the longitudes were figured out by the fourth century BC. But the alignments rested on the latitudes and to whatever point was being determined, like Delphi is a center, you know, that's you know above Athens. And that's a center and it radiates out. So any of these uh, alignments would be in triangles since a triangle is a symbol 
of the feminine. So that's how that they could keep doing this. So different areas have different centers with different alignments and some of these correlate or some of these are different from one another. And mostly to make it simple, uh, since I'm just mentioning these things, is um, Delphi. So Delphi was a very, very famous, very ancient oracle. And if you can look here at this picture here, you see a cleft in the rock for Delphi. Delphi, the way the name Delphi means the feminine organ. And it's the most famous cleft in the ancient world. And there, that was an oracle. And an oracle for everybody in the ancient world would come there to uh, get advice or counsel from the oracle. And the owl is here because the owl is in the house of Virgo, which means Athena. It also means Athen, which is a symbol. But the alignment is coming from south of there, the island called Kos, which means the owl, you know, centered to Delphi. So that's one sort of an alignment that I'm displaying there for, for that. Uh, so all of the ancient world that we're referring to, Greece, I don't know when the name Greece you know, came into usage, but they were the, the Hellenes and another earlier people that the Hellenes overlapped, or the Sea People, the Palestinians, or Palestri, like that. <laughs> and so they do seem to blend through. And very much of what I'm focusing here is the feminine culture that preceded the later Hellenes with Zeus, or Father God culture, and the way that was it the stories or the, the uh, myth and all those kind of things were edited, redacted to more and more insert the Father God, Zeus, into it. And in that sense, really falsified a lot of things in the whole culture. So I'm touching on here mainly the woman's culture. The last part of that culture that I studied in school was called the palace cultures and these areas for a long time remained conservative you know to the feminine it's what I'm touching upon here and if you go down here to this rock here here um, stones or rocks undressed you know that means they weren't painted or, or, or covered with gold or something like that. So we have this, well, I have a small one here. This is a woman's stone. It's called a woman's stone. That is either, you know, triangular or lozenge shape or has a wide girth that would very much, in my view, uh, be the figure of a woman, of an ideal woman who is, you know, broad-hipped like that. And that's actually what I have here. This is, you know, a Greek piece to symbolize that for, quote, woman's rock. And let me show you a contrast to that. This is, of course, a loaf of bread. <laughs> but I'm using that here to represent a rock shaped like this. Rocks shaped like this, even very, very large, tall ones, have been mistakenly called by anthropologists as phallic stones. So in certain places they, where they have found these, you know, they have put them up right because they think that they're phallic stones, but they're not. They are still belong to the feminine culture and it's called a kuduru. A kuduru means that this shows, uh, it's like, like a, a border into her sacred precinct. In other words, it's horizontal and it's on the ground. So it always is very particular to me that when I've been in the Yaqui ceremony and the um, ceremonialists entering into the Tiopo, meaning the temple, they jump over this imaginary Kaduru, for instance. <laughs> oh, yeah, so that's what this is here for. So you can see that. I 
another thing with with here the goddess we're we're talking about, Hera, um, the earth mother earth goddess like that. In the later editions, you know, she's been appropriated by Zeus. Zeus, this figure, as imaginary as it is, it, however, has instituted rape. It's incredible. <clears throat> but the story of Zeus is raping one goddess after another, and so forth. That's the word, you know, he's raping. And so he has appropriated this, you know, super supreme goddess, the supreme bird watcher and uh, uh, but she never yields she never yields to him <clears throat> and so she's been you know typified as a jealous wife a jealous angry wife that's how it's kind of come out like that and it, and, and everything but the, fa the father god or that whole business never really actually succeeds in totally suppressing her even there in Olympia, um, where her temple was, a major temple, um, they put a Zeus temple there to overshadow her. And somehow, I don't know, the, this head got rolled aside or something, and archaeologists have found it and I've replicated it here. Um, and, and, and so forth, so you get, get, get the idea for that. <clears throat> but um, since you have the... Um, divine offspring as it would be from this uh, father god raper um, uh, Hera was not going to yield to that so she opposed another you know somebody who who was very informed in herbs um, I think mean, you know Florothea you must have I, I will take any kind of drug I will take any kind of thing um, that will make me pregnant this so that guy can't do it and I will remain Chast, chaste, you know, like that. So she does. And so, but turned out to be the symbol of that. It must have been the flower of the plant of pomegranate. So here is an actual pomegranate. And uh, depictions of her will often show her actually holding a pomegranate. Uh, right behind it here, I've made a replica. I have copied this from an ancient coin from Olympia of the head of Hera. And what I'm showing is her crown is the head of this uh, pomegranate uh, fruit. So you can see see that there. So that that is, you know, an ancient replica uh, profile of Hera. So you can uh, figure that. And this, this one here um, this, you know, transformed, you know, a, a bridal woman. Um, Hera and her priestesses presided over everything of woman, including marriages. The, that we still have bridesmaid is, you know, a replica, I mean, we can say replica, a remnant of that earlier culture that has <laughs> continued here. And so, I, I have this here as, we'll say, a priestess of Hera, who also used the same name, Hera, and on her cheeks and lips that she has red rouge. And this red rouge, which is also continued with women, was, you know, in terms of cosmetic, a definite signature of the priest, priestesses of Hera. And that's the way I put this, and I have a little bird here, and this piece behind her, is actually an ancient uh, staff uh, uh, mount, a thing on the staff up for the bird, like this. Uh, so we can have all of that now. After she, we'll call it, ate, ate the herb or the pomegranate <clears throat> to give off an offspring, and her offspring is this character over here. This is Hephaestus, Hephaestus. And I've replicated this some time ago from an illustration. And I know that that's who it is because that's what it says right here. <laughs> it passed this. Now, he is, you could say, a virgin birth in that he's uh, not been fathered by Zeus, which doesn't make Zeus happy to say the least. And who, you know, 
throws him out of Zeus's heaven, you know, and it kind of twisted his feet. Uh, but here in this depiction, he is on a donkey. Now, uh, Hephaestus is basically the, the guardian of the house of Scorpio. But here he is on a donkey, which represents the house of Cancer. So this is you know, very interesting, and that's why I have, you know, this is another actual thing that I've replicated here, that um, the donkey is a constellation in, in uh, the constellation of Harris, a star, a star, stars like that. Um, actually, uh, I do remember the, the, the name is um, the Acellus, the Acellus Boreali and uh, the, the uh, Acellus um, uh, Australis. <clears throat> so that's actually the name. In other words, there's two star constellations called uh, North and South and so forth. And exactly what this is depicting, I'm not sure. But it definitely, the donkey, as we're, we're referring to it here, or the Asini, is definitely within the constellation of the house of Cancer. The other thing that goes with this, just to show you something, is that a nearby constellation, very, very near, is uh, the Prosepi. The Prosepi is called the manger. Now, of course, you've heard the word manger because it's always used every Christmas. Uh, and <clears throat> that's where the story of the little boy in the manger. All nativity scenes are going to also include the donkey. Because in the in the, the star relation, that if we can put it, the manger is south of the donkey. So in the in the scene, the donkey is always looking that way. Now this is a clue to the biblical stories as we refer to them. They're all sidereal. They're all star lore, and that's what they've been from. And we can see even through the story of Zeus how these things become so literalized and managed by authorities and people being made susceptible to them literally when they are really about the, the stars and so forth. So that's one way of cluing in here. With, before I leave the pomegranate, it's a good opportunity for me to read this poem by Claudia, since it's the one poem I have today uh, that she's titled, Pomegranate. When I think of your red seeds, rich and deep, I cut you open to find chambers like a beehive, the walls of your cubicles as thin as rice paper, where even a whisper might be heard. I remove a seed as if lifting out an ovum. With what will I fertilize you? What grows outside of biological time? Do I not live in a cubicle of thought, often forgetting that I'm a part of a single organism on a single planet orbiting a huge star? in one of a trillion galaxies. For now, I'm content to gaze at these dry brown hills outside my Nevada window. Slip your pomegranate seed into my mouth. Listen for the rumor of red. <clears throat> now, of course, red is recognized as the favorite color of Hera. And the Amazon women often wore red leather tights and red on their shields, red streamers, and the red rouge, you know, on her cosmetic. All of this is, you know, referring to that, you know, for that, the pomegranate and the way that we are beginning to have a sense of her in all of this. 
So his fastios, again, he is the guardian of the house of Scorpio. He's riding on a donkey, which really represents a star cluster in Cancer. And the idea, along with the you know, Prosepe, star cluster, that the so-called uh, nativity birth, like that, has taken place not in December, but in the time of, of um, Cancer. And the whole mothering uh, sense that accompanies anybody in the sign of Cancer. So we get certain ideas of that. Again, the birds and so forth. So now can I move to another ancient figure and that has been known as Medusa. Medusa has been figured as some very uh, terrible, terrible feminine person, you know, with snakes for hair that uh, anybody looks at her is going to be petrified into stone. Um, <clears throat> and uh, all of the females have all been, you know, misaligned, demonized, quite really. Uh, Medea, you know, who helped Jason find Athena, she's been demonized. Uh, they're all like that. They're all like that. So has uh, Medusa. The actual Greek name is Medosa. Medosa, it means the guardian. So that's what she really is. And she belongs to a small category called the Gorgons. The Gorgons are the guardians, all, you know, being figured as hideous, hideous looking uh, women, always. Um, and somehow this woman, Medusa, we'll call her, she is figured as the queen of them. Now, the Mediterranean Sea has a very limited inset from the Atlantic Ocean. I think it's like 50 miles or so, not, you know, very, very narrow. And I've, I've seen in the research of it, at times it's very similar to the Salton Sea out here, although the sea is very much smaller. But it has, you know, five, six million years ago, the influx of water coming into uh, the Salton Sea or into the Mediterranean Sea sometimes closes up. And sometimes the Mediterranean Sea, even long ago, um, gets down to just a puddle, you know, that there's not much of it. It's almost more to say that it's a very, very large lake. It's, it's climate, you know, what lives, what lives in the water and everything is more liking it to the difference of a lake to the open sea, the Atlantic. Well, that's where the Gorgons, they, where they're situated. There's an island there, it's called Cadiz, or Gades, like that. <clears throat> and actually, in ancient times, it's the Irenea, meaning the Red Island. And that's the place of these Gorgons and Medea. They're guardians. They're guardians into the, this Mediterranean Sea that differs from the Atlantic Ocean. So very much of Medea will be figured as a, a, a person who's come out of the water, come from the, from the ocean like that. But really the name shows that she's a guardian. Uh, what has happened in the later editions is that Athena, who also represents you know, Virgo, now the house of Virgo was guarded by the Gorgons. You know, they're plural, basically, you know, it's three, like that. And she commissioned, you know, a solar hero, Persisus, to um, find her, find Medusa, and kill her, decapitate her. And so that's how the story goes, and everything, even movies, have been made, you know, for that. It goes on and on, like that. So, um, Persisus, you know, by name would be the Destroyer. He's a solar hero. So we're kind of seeing how these things have actually come about and the decapitation. But what it really is, it's in the astrology. It is the change in the house of Virgo from the Gorgons to the virgins, who I can't remember offhand their names, but they each have their names as do the Gorgons. So that's what's really happened, that um, it's a change in the zodiac house of Virgo, principled by Athena, principled by
by her, her city, Athens. And so that's what it really is. Although the whole episode of the head now takes on its own thing, takes on its own dimension. And on the shield that uh, Athena will characteristically have, like the one that was in the Parthenon, she will have the head of the Medusa. What it is, it's a prophylactic mask. And up here, if you can go up here, this is what I have made. I have made my version of the mask, the prophylactic mask of the Medusa on a shield. The shield is another part. The shield, Athena's shield, is made of the goat skin of Amalthea, the very, very ancient goat goddess of the most ancient oracle Dodona in north of Apris. So <clears throat> in uh, ceremonies with the goddess, the women, the priestesses, did shield dances. The particular shield that I had shown you before of Athena are called thunder shields. So that is a mask and so forth. And the offspring of Medusa, in other words, her son, is Pegasus, the flying, the horse with wings. That is, that is her offspring. Uh, in the story of Perseus cutting off her head, he has that Medusa's, uh, that, that Pegasus is born out of the, 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 the head, you know, the neck where the head's been cut off, as if that creature was born from, you know, her neck, <laughs> you can put it, that, put it that way. But to really know how much all of this has been edited and finagled to come out with these kind of things here. And again, my illustrations I have replicated from uh, original Greek illustrations. And down here I have this, this head here to represent Medusa. <laughs> she's actually very beautiful. And not only that, she's an African. So, Black Athena was a book written by uh, Martin Burnell that caused a lot of reactions, you know, because the Aryan model doesn't allow Africans to be in it. <laughs> so that's what Martin Burnell had showed in his book, of Black Athena. Black Athena, what we're really saying is Athena, the, the name Libya is Lamia, the goddess. All of this has come, in, and the Amazons, and the horses have all come from North Africa. And so I had even done the study for um, Shakespeare's Othello. And if you've ever seen you know, any uh, plays of that, uh, or even Laurence Olivier, who I sort of study since I had his godmother as my director, um, he always puts, you know, swarthy makeup on. He's definitely a Moor, a Moor. And at that time, a Moor of the country, Mauritania, which is now Morocco. And this is very significant too, because it was a threat. That empire was a threat to Spain and Coronado was a person, a soldier, who made forays into uh, Mauritania, and that's how he knew that these Indians up here weren't Indians. They were people from North Africa. It's in his journal like that. He, he even replicated in his journal uh, the Alhambra, <laughs> which is a signature of Granada. Granada was the Spanish name for where Zuni is <laughs> named after the um, place in Spain, Granada means the pomegranate. All that all lines up <clears throat> and, and, and so forth. So what I'm saying is that there has been some kind of debate at least that who we're talking about, we had Athena, Black Athena, or we're talking about Medusa, or we're talking about Libya, alias uh, Libya, that they are Africans. They're all Africans. <laughs> so even if they're not West Africans or Central Africans, they certainly are swarthy. 
looking people even today. So that's how I have her here. And I'm going to kind of continue that theme, I hope, you know, in the following uh, Sunday with that, because there's a little bit more to say of that. So again, all of this, you know, is to have an alignment or realignment. I should say the star Venus originally is Hera's star. So uh, if you look at Venus, you can, Venus is the Roman name, you know, for, for her. And uh, Juno is also a Roman name for Hera. So a lot of that also figures in into this, and these are the kind of things I can recall. So all acknowledgement, blessings, and honors to the thousands and thousands of priestesses who served you know, in these temples and had you know the expertise of, of everything that a woman needs. So that will bring me to the end of this session. Thank <laughs> you.